Hello, and welcome to this Cybos session, Bringing Cybersecurity to the Masses, Does the Answer Lie in New Tech? My name is Heather McKenzie, and I'm a freelance writer, and I've attended and reported on Cybos since 1992, when it was um, back in Brussels, and it was a much smaller event, and cybersecurity wasn't on the agenda. It was much simpler times. But in our complex here and now, we have uh, what I think is a really interesting um, group of people on our panel to discuss our topic. And I'm going to introduce them. Uh, I'll start with Sharon Barber, who is Chief Security Officer at Lloyds Banking Group. And Sharon oversees and coordinates all uh, security activities at what is the UK's largest digital bank with 30 million customers. To protect them, Sharon's department brings together governance, assurance, monitoring, and incident management into a single function. Uh, we have Johan Gerber, who's Executive Vice President of, Cyber, of Security and Cyber Innovation at MasterCard, uh, where he oversees product strategies for cybersecurity, financial crime, consumer, online credential management, and dispute resolution. He's head of MasterCard's Security Standards Group, and uh, he participates in several payment industry forums where you might have seen him. Uh, before all this, he was a member of the South African Police Services, and he specialised in organised crime investigations and internal investigations of financial crimes. And we have Lisa Lee, who is Chief Security Advisor at Microsoft, um, and she's a global lead for security, compliance and identity in the business development group at Microsoft. And she's also a former bank regulator. And finally, we have William Hoffman, who is Chief Information Security Officer for UK and Ireland at Deutsche Bank. And William heads the governance and control function for the bank's Chief Security Office globally. Um, he's previously been regional CISO for EMEA, a global chief operating officer for CISO, and has led the information security strategy portfolio and governance functions. He has quite extensive experience across the uh, bank in, in various roles in transaction banking. And I also noticed on his CV that he studied agricultural economics at the University of Melbourne, which is intriguing, but not our topic for today. But if you can get agricultural economics into our discussion, William will be all very impressed, I think. Uh, so our discussion is about cybersecurity and bringing it to the masses. Uh, of course, we know that the coronavirus pandemic has accelerated the adoption of e-commerce. Um, the Bank for International Settlements um, in a recent bulletin uh, pointed out that the lockdowns have led to a surge in online demand for many goods and services and that the online share of retail sales in China, Germany, the UK and the US have risen by between four and seven percentage points. Um, so many organizations, particularly small, smaller businesses, have had to adapt to the new world and go online. And that's exposed these companies and their customers and also their banks to heightened cyber risk. Uh, the Financial Stability Board in April 2020 uh, released a consultative document in which it describes cyber incidents as a threat to the stability of the global financial system. And a major cyber incident, they warned, uh, if, if it wasn't properly contained, could seriously disrupt financial systems, including critical financial infrastructure, which would lead to broader financial stability implications. So cybersecurity is, is, is a very important topic, obviously. Uh, now, the first question I have is for our two bankers, um, William and Sharon, and um, I'm, I'm thinking that given the interconnectedness of, of transaction banking, um, whether an organization's cybersecurity um, measures will only be as strong as, as the weakest link. So does that mean that cybersecurity should be viewed as a collective responsibility? So maybe, Sharon, if you'd like to start. Is that Heather? So I think, you know, as security professionals, we know the first part of that question is certainly true and weak points have been exploited many times. You just have to look at incidents like the Bank of Bangladesh, Heist, the WannaCry, many examples since then. So uh, so definitely, definitely true point there. So from a collective responsibility, if there was a significant incident, then the NCSC would lead that. However, you know, how do we be proactive and so that we're able to prevent that in the first place. And I think that's the bit that's the broader responsibility that we have to take. And that's on all of us, all of our businesses to educate 
our staff and customers and make that a societal responsibility. I think um, when we think about that, security shouldn't be seen as competitive. We need to work together in the broader UK to make sure that you know it's for the better good. And today we do share a significant amount of intelligence and technical data with industry forums. Um, many of us have active security com campaigns. We have cyber academies and online learning, and all of those things are really important for us to make sure as organizations we you know we learn ourselves but we must the collective bit is we've got to share that with our customers our clients and also our suppliers so that we can learn together um, and, and you know learn from each other i think that's really important and there's other ways that we can help collectively which is around the mentoring both internally and externally again they're, they're great things that we all need to step into particularly when we have the resources to do that and if we think more broadly when we think more forward as we move to public cloud many of us are looking at that move had we moved there safely it becomes even more important and i think a compromise of public cloud as we all know could lead to a challenge for many people so i think that's even more um important for us to look at so standardization in the cloud is pretty critical on how we move that forward so i think it brings us many opportunities because it's highly configurable but many challenges because it's highly complex as well and so again as we move forward so the things we can do in the past but we also need to think about how do we do that to set standards in the forward how do us the big tech companies you know drive those standards and actually you know able to share best practices so it isn't easy for organizations um, and individuals to be compromised so i think there's a lot we can do there's a lot we do do and i think there's still more collectively we have to do yeah yeah there's a lot of interesting points you bring up there um william what what are your thoughts on on this idea of a collective I mean, absolutely, cyber is definitely a collective responsibility. We look at it as a team sport, right? We don't compete with other organizations when it comes to cyber. We speak to our peers at all of the large um, other financial institutions. Sharon and I work together on a number of industry groups in the UK, specifically on sharing best practice, sharing information on emerging threats, um, what are some of the things that we've seen that can help protect other organizations? And it's very important that we take that responsibility seriously. We have learned uh, through real life incidents um, that the interconnectivity between the financial organizations and indeed the entire supply chain, whether that is technology organizations, whether that's our clients, whether that's outsourced providers or otherwise, demonstrates that any incident that impacts one aspect of that supply chain has the potential to be very contagious into, um, you know, into other organizations. Over the past couple of months, although not targeted at financial services, we've been watching what's been happening with the Solar Winds campaign, which clearly demonstrates the, um, the importance of, of ensuring the integrity of that full supply chain. So yes, we do work together on this. It's important that we continue to do so it's important that we share information and it's important that we avoid any sort of polarization in terms of the skills and capabilities that organizations have to protect themselves. So is that is that um, you both mentioned the, the sharing of information between banks? Is that is that on a sort of informal basis or is it formal? Are there formal mechanisms for that? And, and is it something that could become like a kind of you a sort of utility type arrangement? What um or is it, is it good enough to be an informal setup? So it's actually both. I think there, there are definitely formal arrangements for sharing information. In fact, Swift provides um, an excellent information sharing platform. There are other industry groups, whether, whether it's FSI SAC or others that enable that. All of us also maintain our networks of contacts. And if we see something that, you know, that specifically targets another organization, We'll always pick up the phone and make sure that our peers are aware of what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Sharon? I would totally agree with that. Um, we, we, have, we have lots of formal and informal sharing. I mean, Bill and I were on a call just this week, you know, looking at what we can do, particularly on third parties and cloud. And um, so it's really, really important. And uh, But you, you touched on your know, utility model. I do think um, your point of utility model is, a, is an important one. Um, there is an industry group called Operational Resilience Collaboration Group, and they're currently looking at this actually, particularly around third parties and how we do assurance models uh, going forward. And I think that 
is something that we all need to support and get behind. Because I think that would be better for us. It would be better for the industry because we'll make it a safer industry. We'll make it easier for the smaller organisations, but also make it easier for the third parties because they'll only have one assurance happen to them instead of like hundreds. So um, I think as a whole, I think utility really has a place and it's an area that I think definitely needs progressing. And it is progressing, but maybe we could um, go a bit faster. Right. OK. Um, so so you talk, we talked about smaller organisations. So so um, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm going to ask Lisa and Johan here for their for their thoughts on on how we can bridge the gap between the larger organisations, you know, such as Deutsche Bank or Lloyds Bank that can have quite sophisticated um, cybersecurity programmes and smaller banks and, and, and organisations that may not have the resources in terms of personnel or funding to match those sorts of capabilities. So, um, Lisa, what's, what do you see at Microsoft um, in terms of that sort of gap and what can be done? You know, I, th I think we see the gap in, in the sense that you know, all organizations of every size struggle with the challenges of cybersecurity. I don't think size size matters so much. I think the challenge is there either way. Um, it's just a multiplier effect, the larger that you are in the sense of you have better controls, but you also have, you know, bigger threats. And so, you know, for those smaller organizations, I, I do think that they have the message that cybersecurity matters. I think they understand you know, that this is a problem that we all have to solve and we're better solving it together than apart. But I, I worry more, you know, almost outside the financial system, because I think in highly regulated industries, you get a lot of um, focus on these kind of challenges. But outside the regulated entities and the commercial, commercial businesses that many of us work with as customers and so forth, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's still a big challenge there. And that affects the financial system. You know, those uh, potential companies um, can introduce risk into the financial system to some extent. And so, you know, that it's, it's that we know we're all connected. We know that all businesses are, are connected in some way or another today. And we're so reliant on the, the financial sector um, for our economics. Um, and so, William, I'm almost getting the agriculture in there, but not quite, um, you know, but I, you know, so I think it's, um, we, we have to work on these, these industries where uh, they aren't regulated and they may not have had the messaging and the benefit of training and awareness and, you know, all of the relationship building that we have in, within the financial sector, uh, which is so important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Johan. Yeah, I don't know. This is a fascinating question, you know, and I think what the pandemic has done for us uh, is really intriguing on this specific question. You know, you almost had a forced innovation and a forced move into this online space by a number of, of companies out there that in the past kind of stayed on the sideline a little bit. You know, we used to talk about digital first as being a, a, a strategic imperative, but now it's a business imperative, right? So all of a sudden, everybody has to be online. And I think Lisa's called it correct that the, the problem is what's much more broader in the fact that so many third parties that is involved in this ecosystem, the ecosystem is no longer cut in very small or, in, or distinct industries, you know, that this is financial sector and this is something else. It's a hyper-connected world. Everything is connected. And the, and the digital ecosystem is becoming very, very complex. Um, and so, you know, to get back to your question around what are we doing, we're thinking about this in a little bit of two categories. There's our small businesses who's delivering a service to an end customer. Uh, who's you know just been forced very quickly to adapt to a digital uh, strategy, um, and we are actually partnering. And I think Lisa's company is in the same boat as we are with companies like the Global Cyber Alliance, uh, like the Cyber Readiness Institute, to actually provide resources to these companies. A lot of education is on there, free tools and services available to them. Uh, I think that's something that more and more larger companies can do, where we invest in some of these resources that are really there for the better of the industry and the whole ecosystem as a whole. I think that's something that's important. So we're an active participant in that. And then the other part is something that Sharon mentioned around, uh, around third parties. And how do we understand the risks that are involved in third parties a little bit better? And something that we've done, uh, we've actually invested in a, in a capability to understand the risk of any third party involved in our supply chains uh, of digital and financial services. And we hope that that transparency, when everybody can see their cyber posture being put out in, 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 in not only in public, but visible to those who want to do business with them. Uh, that also should help in raising the bar a little bit to say, I need to get my cyber score up so that I'm seen as a responsible player in this ecosystem. So those are kind of two of the things that we are doing 
in, in order to, to help it. But it is a complex question. It's not an easy one to answer. I think there's a lot more that we that we should do collectively as a as a broad industry. Mm, and and you talk about the complexity there. And and um, my next question is is about um, when we were having our earlier discussions planning this session. Um, uh, many of you, I think you were all mentioning this idea that um, it's important to make cybersecurity um, understandable, and um, you know that that it's a complex uh, it's a complex topic. But you know there are maybe some basics that might be overlooked, and and maybe if we start with Lisa, because I know you were talking, we were talking about hygiene um, in cybersecurity. So um, if you want to kick off our discussion now about you know trying to um, make cybersecurity just understandable for people? Well, I think sometimes I, I've wondered, you know, after after we had our, our conversation and some others that I've had, I wonder if we need to almost um, change the terminology just a little bit, because we talk about hygiene and basics, and it almost makes it sound simple. I, I'm not sure that any of it is really all that simple, um, you know, but there there is kind of a minimum expectation of uh, what companies need to be doing. And we've known these things for a long time and it hasn't changed very much. Um, you know, we need to patch, uh, we need better controls around access. Um, we need to, you know, uh, you know, limited access, uh, you know, need to know only um, least privilege approach. And so, you know, there are lots of other factors that come into play here. And those really haven't changed over time. How we do them has changed the technology that allows it and the auto level of automation that we have, but we haven't gotten that much better at doing them. And that has to change drastically. Um, we are way past you know, the, the demarcation line of if you're not meeting the minimum expectations, it's okay, you probably won't be attacked. That day is gone. And so, um, you know, there we're we're beyond just you know the if we think about hygiene, we're beyond that. Just wash your hands and you'll be okay. I mean, let's face it, most of us, even with COVID, still have not gotten great with wash your hands. You know, I think there's so we we just struggle with these things that we need to do all the time. But I think COVID has helped and uh, given us that analogy of how important it is, you know, that we do these things. And and so just as we've done with the pandemic. You know, we do need to do the same things with our businesses in terms of being very mindful of there is a, a set of um, processes, a set of controls, a set of practices, and we can't deviate away from those. In fact, we have to continually get better and better. We can't live at the minimum bar. You know, mm -hmm. we're not meeting the minimum and we can't live there anyway. So we have to continually move forward. And, you know, I think, you know, just as we talk about, you know, wash your hands and hygiene, we have to start thinking about, you know, just as we would with our bodies, you know, it's more of eat your vegetables, regularly exercise, you know, so there's there's more and there's more and there's more that we have to get better at. But we do need to find ways to make it more simple in terms of how we communicate and more automation because, um, you know, the, the, the level, the volume of activity, the number of devices people are using and so forth, you know, we've got to continue to automate and make this simple um, because we can't expect everyone to be a cybersecurity expert, but we do need them to be a cybersecurity player. They have a role, we all have a responsibility. And so we just have to help them, you know, understand what that responsibility is and give them the tools to carry that out. Mm, okay. So so Bill, what what do you think are the basics and and um and they can be got right. So I, I absolutely echo Lisa's point about changing the way we talk about security. Um, we as security people have a tendency to use complicated terms and sometimes a lot more complicated than they have to be. And that means when we go into conversations with our business partners, when we go into conversations with our boards, with clients, we're not always speaking the same language. And one of the things that I think is really important for security organizations is to um, talk about what we do in a way that makes sense to people that are not security practitioners. And the way we do that is start with what is the threat? What is the bad thing, the harm that can happen to us as an organization and to our clients, and then build the story from there, right? So ransomware clearly has been, um, you know, I think one of the most prominent threats that we've seen, not just in financial services, but universally over the past, um, over the past couple of years, 
it passes what I call the mother-in-law test. If my mother-in-law knows what it is, then it's definitely something that has kind of, you know, hit the hit the hit the mainstream. And when we go into our conversations, rather than talk about, you know, we need to have good endpoint detection and response and privileged access and anomaly detection, what we should be saying is we have a high risk of being impacted by ransomware, and these are the things that we need to do as an organization to protect ourselves against it. And by putting it into a perspective and starting with the harm that can happen in a way that people understand it, it makes it much easier for non-security people to kind of come along for that journey with us. In terms of what that means for the, for the basics, I think there's a lot of security that organizations are able to implement today um, without spending a single dollar, pound, or euro more than what they're spending. They're not easy things to do because it's things like patching and knowing where all of your assets are. And what I think is probably one of the hardest things for organizations to do is to create a culture of security, right? Changing culture is, is very hard for organizations to do. And I know we'll talk about that in, the, in, in a little while, but you know, creating a culture of security and doing some of these foundational things and also um, you know, bringing the language back to what are the threats and how do we prevent, uh, protect ourselves against them are some really easy things for organizations to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, thank you. And, and Sharon, I know you, you spoke about the importance of education in, in um, helping to make cybersecurity understandable. That was both within and sort of internally and externally at the bank. You know, absolutely. I, I mean, I just echo what Lisa and Bill both said. Everyone has a responsibility to that, and um, to make sure we we understand cyber and we, you know we take responsibility for that. I think um, what's difficult is, as they both articulated, which is how do we turn something that's quite technical into something that everyone understands? And I think that's the key to education. The key on education is making it, bringing it home, making it real. Just as Bill said. You, know, you talk about ransomware, but what does that really mean? How do you make that real? How can you um, tell a story that says, well, actually, if this happens to you, then your business breaks and this is how it breaks. And actually, you know, that it's a, a significant impact and actually really make that real. And I think the way we've addressed that in our education with our internal teams, we've gone away from, you know, sending out documents and sending out PowerPoints and you know, we've, we've actually changed it to make it more fun. I think you've got to connect emotionally with people. So it's that emotional connection that makes them want to learn and how to learn. And so it's about how do you change things? So I think you need a suite of um, options to be able to bring people on the journey because everyone learns differently. So using one, one um, way of communicating, I don't think works. So, you know, you've got to have that suite that says, okay, the younger generation like the cyber arcade game style that we do. And we, we put some things out there around puzzles and learning and training and they, they love that. And then there's some, there's a lot of technical people that like, don't like being told what to do. And so they like to learn by doing. And so we've got some innovative online learning. And what you do with that, you've got that ranges from boardroom training, which is quite high level, to pen testing, which is very technical. Um, and it's a, a technology that allows you to, it prompts you questions. You have to go and find the answers. It doesn't give you the answers. And so by learning, you actually learn a lot more. And so there's some really, I think, innovative, different ways of pushing education out there to people that is in a way that makes it um, stick with them. And I think the other way is making it um, personally attractive to them in a way that it can help them at home as well as at work. So what we try to do is to say, well, this is actually um, an issue for you when you go outside of the organization and you go home, it's really important for you to have all of these, um, this understanding and all of the controls you have in place and knowledge for when you go home as well, because actually these are the things that can happen to you mm -hmm. from that perspective. So there's quite a lot we do there um, from a, a colleague perspective, but we also do work with clients and customers as well. So making that documentation understandable, um, it's harder obviously with customers because you've got such a broad set of customers to reach, but clients um, and third parties, we, we do quite a lot with in trying to articulate and spend time with them. So they do understand it as well. So there's a lot there. I think you have to um, adapt the training to the needs, I think is the way forward. And even if I if I could, Heather, you know, even uh, to take a point that Sharon made and a point that William made, um, I think if you look at this, the spectrum of, you know, what we talk about and who we talk about uh, that particular topic to, um, you know, think about ransomware, for example. Um, you know, we can have the conversation about what does that mean to Sharon's point and how did it happen and what's the, the impact. But, you know, think about going younger in that perspective. 
you know, what would the impact be of ransomware if every kid growing up knew about making backups? And they'd been hearing about backups forever and forever and forever. And, and that was just built into their nature. Uh, you know, so by the time they got to the business world, they would just expect and they, you know, that would be a, a, a planned strategy. Um, so I think sometimes we have to go younger and then sometimes we have to look at the other end of the spectrum of where we're focusing and how we're talking about it because a, a lot of us now are working on uh, or have implemented zero trust strategies. And so we've been talking about zero trust for a while. For some companies it's newer, for some it's been around for a while and you know, we've implemented the strategy but we haven't necessarily talked about the zero trust culture. And so even at that spectrum, you know, we've talked about assume breach, you know, that that's the strategy that we have, but we haven't built that into our culture and our awareness yet in terms of, cause we still have people asking us, you know, well, why didn't you keep these guys out? Why didn't you keep the bad guys out? Well, in a zero trust strategy, that's, that's not the strategy. The strategy is to mitigate the impact because we're going to live with an assume breach mentality. So, you know, it's just these different uh, ends of the spectrum in terms of how we're approaching and who the message is for and how we, we need to adjust our, our conversation a little. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do. We do get to zero trust um, in, a, in, in a later question. I was going to ask um, Sharon, actually, and, and, and maybe all of you that Sharon brought up this um, idea of, uh, you know, making it personal to people and taking it home like taking this awareness of cyber security into their homes and and i was wondering that i assume that was very helpful in the early days of the pandemic when when you were suddenly all faced with having your workforce at home and 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 obviously that kind of um raised some some cyber security issues and apparently phishing sort of accelerated a lot or there was a lot more did that did that was that, had that laid a good groundwork, do you think, Sharon, for, for when the bank staff were actually working from home, that they, that they were a bit more aware of um, cybersecurity and the issues? I think it definitely helps. You know, we're, we've been working on you know, the basics with the business for some time, like phishing. Please don't click on that link. If you're not sure, don't click. You know, there's that. I mean, you know, we might get onto it a bit later, but I think there's technology that, that takes that type of challenge away in the future. Um, as we work through that, but definitely, it definitely is people um, started to work from home. Now, we, we use our own technology, so it isn't using their own technology. So from a bank perspective, it's the same things were still relevant as when they were in the office. Um, don't click on any links that come through, et cetera. But we were still, we still educated and actually we pushed a lot of information to them to say, and actually you're going to be targeted at home as well. So be really careful at home on your emails and what you're doing there. So we were trying to educate on both sides. So I definitely think it set us in good stead as we moved into that because there, there was a lot more phishing um, activity that, that went on in the early days of COVID. Not new techniques, but but definitely more um, phishing activity. So oh, yeah, uh, hmm. and, I do think yeah. uh, that, uh, you know, important part of this comes back to education and to Lisa's point, it's across multiple levels, whether it is around zero trust or around don't click on this link. I think we need to look at this from, from different angles. You know, the other piece that I think is really important for us, if you look at the pace of innovation right now, Heather, things are changing so fast, you know, 5G is coming in, quantum computing is coming in. So even our cybersecurity experts will have to be retooled on a much higher frequency than in the past ever before. And I actually think our educational sector has a big role to play in this. How do we retool our workforce, not just on cyber, but how to think security by design? You know, as security cyber uh, or cybersecurity experts, we have a bit of mea culpa here. You know, for a long time, we've been sitting there and smiling when everybody's trying to talk about cyber and we can see they don't really know what they're talking about. But if we want to lift security by design, if we want to lift privacy by design, everybody needs to understand what it means not to click on a link. It has to be simplified. It has to be part of you know, not just a cybersecurity curriculum, but a, a broader curriculum. It has to kind of make its way into just about everything we do and across different levels, whether it's somebody who's building code, whether it's a decision maker in middle or senior management, or whether it's a board that's trying to figure out what are the exact KPIs that I need to focus on to make sure that we're actually moving the needle. I do think we need to look at this across multiple dimensions and layers. And I do think our educational sector can play a bigger role. I'll give you an example of what we've been doing uh, we've actually been partnering with some of the local universities uh, to offer, you know, coding or security by design coding courses for our engineers, for different product experts. So how do we just get this 
part of our everyday work, not a four year study that I do and then I go off in the world and I never go back to my textbook. It has to be more continuous rather than a learning at a point of time and then we move on. So I do think there's a big opportunity for us to do some really good innovation in this space and just change the, change the dynamic on this quite a bit. Mm, mm, that's a really interesting point, yes. And um, Johan, you, you mentioned there, you brought up uh, talking about technologies, which, which uh, is, segues very nicely into the next question, actually, which is um, <laughs> about the role that technology can play in, in bringing cybersecurity to the masses. So, so maybe if we stay with you and um, you, you just talk us through from, from what you're seeing um, in terms of technology, that can help on this and and you know whether whether it's it's something that might be out of the reach of, of or people think it might be out of their reach you know if you if you look at some of the big themes in the world right now be that around sustainability um i think cyber for me fits kind of in that same realm that i think corporations has an accountability to make sure that we design our our technology with cyber included right I do think that technology is the is the enabler of getting it out there. We will never completely solve the all the, the whole puzzle, but I do think if we all start with that security by design in the way we do things, I think we can move the needle quite a bit. You know, if you look at the just where technology is going with 5G, with everything in the cloud, we do see a centralization of a lot of tech. And that for me is an opportunity that the more we build into those foundational aspects where most of these things run and operate the more we can we can at least cover a base set and then you know everybody else who uses that along the along the along the chain can add their pieces on it so i think it's an accountability that each each of us have to share in how do we build i think it's a place where we collectively as an industry has to come together uh, not just within our own geographies but across the world and across industries you know whether it's the manufacturers of iot devices uh, people making banking platforms uh, you know, our financial system platforms, people creating user experiences where consumers can come in and have a beautiful experience. But in the end, all of these are connected. And tomorrow, as a consumer gets in their car and they expect payments to happen as they pass through, you know, the local coffee shop, their uh, the gas station, all of that. In the end, all of these things come together. So it comes back for me to, um, I think we have a big role to play to, to, to design it. Technology is a really, really big enabler. Then you put in education. So you're looking at a multi-layered strategy is ultimately what will work here is, is the way we are looking at it. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, Lisa, and, and, and from your point of view at Microsoft, what um, what role do you think technology plays there? Is it is like Johan says, is it some it's one of many pieces that have to come together? Well, I think automation is going to be a big piece of this. You know, we we focus a lot on automating a lot of the tasks and making that simpler. But I think there's potentially a, a market opportunity here for some companies to come along, whether they're you know small, local, regional, or or more broadly, um, in terms of managed services, you know, I think there's some some opportunity there that that hasn't been exercised. I mean, those companies have existed, but I'm not sure that it's being broadly used the way that it could be. Um, you know, so for your really small business who needs this type of service, um, do they know where to go to get it? Do they know, do, do they have the ability to weigh the, the capabilities that a company has in terms of the service that can be provided? And, you know, I think to some extent, companies, especially small businesses, are going to be looking for kind of the, um, the all in. You know, I, can you provide my technology support as well as my security support? And so I think there's a, a potential market opportunity that I think we'll start seeing com uh, companies moving into that space because the need is there. Um, you know, is it is it a well-known need yet? That may be debatable. There, you know, I think there's still some work to do, but I, I think the, there's a potential market there. All right. Okay. Thank you. And um, Sharon, um, what what uh, what are the sort of maybe you can share with us some of the uh, technologies, of, the approach that uh, Lloyd's Bank is taking, and and maybe um, some of your best practices that you feel you can share with us. Yeah, sure. I think there are um, two parts really of this. I think there's how do we educate colleagues and customers with technology, and then how do we use technology to help colleagues and customers sort of transparently, if we think about it in that way. And the first bit, if we think about using innovative technology, I mentioned what you can do for training, et cetera, and there's some great technologies that you can use for that. But ever since we've 
moved into the COVID era, um, using Zoom and Teams is now an everyday, multi-day. We live on Zoom and Teams now, you know, in that way, whereas we didn't a year ago. It, we used it, but not in the same way. And I think that's definitely technology we can use to um, educate significant numbers of people all at once and safely. And so that's a, that's a, a good way that we can use technology. And also we can use technology um, to help customers by building in checks into our banking applications to remind customers about fraud before they make payments, et cetera, because that's quite important to try and combat the scams that are going on in that way. And then from a, a technology, how it helps us, I started to touch on it earlier, but if we think about phishing, um, whilst we educate our colleagues and we educate customers, don't click on the link if you don't know what it is and how safe it is, if you can't be sure, people still do click on the link and it only takes one person to click on the link to, to make it ineffective, all of the controls that you've, you've put in place. Um, and so there are some really good new technologies out there that um, do isolation technology um, that you can use that actually you can put in place, people can click if they need to. And actually it, all it does is it doesn't deliver the content down, it just delivers a picture and that actually protects you from phishing in that way. And so I think that's innovative technology that you can use. And we're definitely implementing that right now across our um, state, just so we can help our colleagues um, in the phishing area. Because I think that is a, whilst it's not the only way to be compromised, it is significantly uh, the most uh, chosen way to try to compromise people. So I think there's lots there. And then I think um, as we move forward into cloud, as we're talking about cloud privacy, how we design and implement cloud is critical. And the new technologies allow you to write policy as code. And to do that, you can then mandate your controls rather than have to check them you know, afterwards. And I think that's a way forward. So I think we'll be doing um, that a lot more, I think, um, efficiently. Um, there's a lot more automation to come through, as Lisa touched on. And I think that's the area that we need to sort of um, adapt and embrace uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. OK. And, and uh, William, from, from Deutsche Bank's point of view, yeah, so it, it's interesting. Everything that we've heard from Johan, from Lisa and Sharon is, is very familiar to us, right? And I, if I think about <clears throat> the opportunities that we get from new technologies and particularly the move toward public cloud, that absolutely introduces new security and resilience capabilities. We need to be transparent with ourselves. It also introduces new risks and challenges, but clearly the benefits from a security and a resilience perspective um, outweigh that, especially well-managed. I think from an overall um, technical um, innovation perspective, the theme of automation and orchestration will continue to increase. The sheer volume of information that we're receiving, the sheer volume of um, events that we're responding to means that we need to be uh, much more efficient and much more automated in terms of how we manage that. And we've been absolutely implementing um, you know, incremental technology platforms that allows us to process that much more data to understand at a deeper level what's going on within and outside of our network. I think another important part of that is increasing through technology our ability to anticipate when something is going to happen. So moving away from just doing straightforward analysis to understanding not just within our own environment but on the outside, what are the threats, how are they materializing, and what is the next thing that we need to be worrying about. And then finally, um, you know, I think some of the advances that we're seeing in authentication as well and starting to move away from passwords, which are a really, really clunky, old fashioned way of um, logging on to things, um, both in a personal life and in a professional life, the quicker that we can kind of move to an environment where we're less dependent upon you know, those, those complex multi string passwords um, will absolutely help bring cybersecurity, not just to our organizations, but clearly to the masses as well. Okay, okay. Well, sadly, I see that we, we are actually running out of time. It's, it's been such an interesting conversation, I haven't really noticed. Um, but I did say we were going to go back to this, uh, this question of, of trust, zero trust, which Lisa um, raised. So maybe if we could have each of you sort of maybe a quick, uh, a quick sort of uh, pricey of how you, how you see that idea of, of trust, you know, where, where trust fits in cybersecurity. And, and maybe we'll begin with you, Johan. Yeah, look, this is this is this is something that in itself can probably take us forty-five minutes just to talk through for trust. Um, you know, on the one hand, we're asking our consumers uh, jump into the car of a stranger that you've met, never met, or go and stay in a house that you've never been to or seen, and and the other end, please don't click on this link. And at the same time, we have 
with the pandemic, a whole new set of consumers who have been trying to avoid the online space like the plague now don't have a choice because I can't get my groceries delivered unless I can do it, do this. So it's a really big, uh, big, big balance, which I think comes back to a lot of what we discussed throughout the whole process here. I think there's an accountability on us as, as, uh, as, as banking, financial institutions, as tech firms to make sure that we put trust as in, in, embedded into the tech that we do so we can foster that with the consumers and they can trust our brands and they can trust what we do. I think that's going to be critically, uh, I know we're running out of time, so I'm not going to labor that too much, but that's where it has to start for us. We cannot trust that the consumers will all figure this out. So I'll, 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 I'll leave this one there, but I think it's a really, really complex question. Thank you for that. Right, so, so finally, if we wrap up, um, I think I thought it would be really good to ask everyone what, what your ideal cybersecurity culture is, because we've, we've talked about cybersecurity security culture during the um, during the discussion. So um, I think it'd be great to get everyone's views on what um, what your ideal cybersecurity culture would be. And maybe we'll start with uh, William. Thanks, thanks Heather. When, when I think about culture and we think about culture within Deutsche Bank, we look at it in a couple of dimensions. The first is the values, right? Do people understand the importance of security and do we feel it inherently in our DNA, in our processes, in the way we interact with clients, in the way we manage um, our businesses. The second aspect of it is the behaviors, right? What are the things that we do individually? Are we smart in terms of choosing whether to print something? Are we locking our PCs when we get up from our desks during normal times when we're in the office, right? Those are the things that we do individually, even without thinking about it, if not, even if no one is watching, right? And the third aspect are the rituals. What are the things that we do and we're together that help promote security culture? One of the ways that we can do that is by talking about current threats when we start a meeting or other things that we do and we're together. So if we think about culture in terms of values, behaviors, and rituals, these are some of the tools that we can use to help drive culture, security culture across the organization. Okay, and and Sharon, what do you think a good culture is? Well, Heather, I think I think the ideal culture is when everyone understands, owns, and takes action on their cybersecurity risks across the business. So that's perfect, right? If everyone we can get everyone to do that, but that's a journey, and that's how do we, you know, get everyone to understand what they need to do and work with that over time. Now, a couple of ways that we've approached this at Lloyd's is to look at it both from an organisation perspective and then also. Um, a culture education perspective. So if we think about organizations, how do you get the business to own um, the, and be accountable for cyber for everything they do? And a number of organizations and businesses would have put in um, roles like BSO, so business information security officers, we call ours divisional resilience and security officers. And so it, they're accountable within their division. So accountability is just not on the central team, it's with the business divisions themselves. So firstly, there's an organizational way that you can help towards that and that's around accountability and then secondly we think about a uh, culture so we measure culture actually we created a culture scorecard for all of the businesses and we thought about how do we do that and that's not perfect by any way um, but what it does is it it sets out it measures what they do on a day-to-day -day basis on some of the things that that Bill mentioned around have they got their user access correct, correct? have they done their recertifications um, are they doing all of the right activities that they should be doing? Are there any policy violations that they shouldn't be doing? Um, and we measure all of those things. Actually, we set them targets as well around how to improve those. And we put them on their divisional balance scorecard. So it is a group responsibility and it's a group focus. And I think that's some of the ways you can do to actually move the culture because you make them accountable for it. So there's a few ways, um, not perfect, um, but definitely some ways to think about. Mm -hmm. And Lisa? How about you? So I think about two things when I think about culture. Um, one, I think about the classification of data, because I think, in, especially in financial services, that's been an exercise and it's been a journey to Sharon's point. And it, but I think it's a great um, example of how culture becomes part of the tooling and part of our response. We have the capability now to classify an email, to classify a document, classify a, a database or a spreadsheet. And, you know, we have the tooling to make that simpler. We have the tooling to make it automated and so forth. But we still have people trying to go around it or not thinking about it when they need to. So the tooling can help automate that, but we still have to work on that culture of, um, you know, this is why it matters. You know, this is 
when you should use it. This is when um, it's needed and when and why it's important and why it's valued. So to me, that's a great example of how we're not quite there yet on culture because um, you know we shouldn't have to remind each other. Uh, oh, by the way, you should have you know classified this email as confidential. Um, so you know that's an example. And then the other thing that I like to think about is the the message that we're giving our children, but that we should also be giving ourselves because I love talking to kids in schools about being cyber aware and using cybersecurity. And the big message for them is this is part of our national protection. This is part of our national infrastructure protection. And you have a role in that. You are part of our cyber army, so to speak. And everything you do matters. And every time you don't do something, there can be consequences. And I think that message plays in our companies as well. So it's not just a message for children, it's a message for all of us that we're all part of that national protection effort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Johan. Yeah, I think there's some really great points here. I think it's a multi-layered approach, right? But it starts with getting the basics right and owning it. I think everybody has to own it, which means, you know, all the things we talked about earlier on education, make sure people understand this thing has to be there. But ultimately, everybody has to own it end to end. If I write a piece of code, if I am the one that's starting a, a, a track on an email, irrespective of what it is, down to the lowest level, you have to own it and then understand. You know. Interesting enough, if you think about what SolarWinds has done in terms of damaging trust around, can I trust the third party uh, code that I'm getting from a well-trusted system that we had forever? If I'm a coder, how the code passes through my chain, you know, from I'm the developer, hand, being handed off to somebody who tests it, everybody has to think through. So that ownership is really, really important, but being enabled by technology, I think things like AI is gonna help us tremendously in, in doing this, and especially weaving through the complexity of cybersecurity. Yeah, I would say multi-layer, starting with owning it, getting the basics right. If we get those two things right, I think we can make a big dent. Uh, we're not there yet for sure, but I think that that's where at least where I think we would love to start. Okay, okay, great, great, thank you all. I want to thank everybody very much for, for um, making themselves available for the discussion and, and really um, having such interesting um, points to bring up. And, and I hope it's, uh, I hope it's uh, been very useful to everyone who's watching. And um, bad luck, uh, William, you didn't get an agriculture uh, reference. In fact, Lisa <laughs> did. So <laughs> next time, next time, lucky. So um, uh, once again, thank you, everyone. And thank you for watching. Thank you.